for joining us who is joining us. This is week two of our Let's Talk About series. This is a daily conversation that we're having during Suicide Prevention Week and in Suicide, or excuse me, Suicide Prevention Month. And within the month, this is the actual week. And so this week, as you can probably imagine, we are talking about suicide prevention. We have a variety of different presentations. Um, today, we're going to talk about protective factors, and I'm here with my coworker, Mel Batchelor, who you all got to meet last week. Um, I think it was Tuesday, in our very first presentation. Tomorrow, we'll hear about adverse childhood experiences and the link between adverse childhood experiences and the risk of suicide. Thursday, the State Suicide Prevention Council is going to do a QPR training, and we'll broadcast that to our Facebook page. And on Friday, um, it'll be a Talk Save Li Saves Lives presentation with um, folks from the American Federation on Suicide Prevention and the Chris Kyle Hospital in Anchorage. So we got a packed week. we got a packed month. we got some, a packed presentation here for you all today. Um, and like Ma was saying, Closed captioning is available. Um, there's a little thing on the Zoom link on Zoom to click closed captions. There's going to be a recording of this available to you all. And so those of you on Facebook and switch over to Zoom, you'll be able to see a link if you scroll through our Facebook feed if you prefer to get that captioning through Zoom. Otherwise, you can watch it on Facebook and it'll be the same info. So I think that's it. Now that I miss anything that we need to do to intro this. No, I think we got it. Perfect. Um, so without further ado, we're talking about protective factors today. Protective factors are the things that keep you safe so that when adverse conditions exist, which they exist for everybody, um, your mental health doesn't decline as much as it otherwise could. So you go through a rough patch, you have um, difficulty in a relationship, uh, lose a job, um, just experience frustration or depression for any reason. Like those are human experiences. Those are going to happen. And the effect they can have on your well being can be large or small. And protective factors make it more likely. If you increase your protective factors, it's more likely that, that those adverse experiences will have a small effect on you. So that if I were to lose my job or lose my relationship tomorrow, I wouldn't suffer more than the average person would suffer in any kind of crummy event. I think that's the easiest way that I can explain protective factors. Uh, Mel, how do you think about this? How do you conceptualize this conversation? And you're muted right now. If you're going to mute yourself, that'd be perfect. Sorry. Um, so I think of protective factors um, in, a, in a similar way. Um, and protective factors um, obviously, you know, are there to protect you from any kind of like adverse um, continuation of an adverse experience, but also, you know, sometimes protective factors can be things that we don't really consider. So like a really obvious protective factor might be like um, to have a support system, but then we also sometimes forget that protective factors can be more like basic needs like I need a housing or I need access to food or I need transportation or you know so um, that's kind of what we'll be getting into a little bit too is sort of how that um, protective factors for suicide prevention can exist sort of on a hierarchy of needs and um, how addressing all of those needs is really um, beneficial and not just you know, looking at the social side or the system side or, um, you know, the, the mental health side and really just looking at how all of that stuff is uh, connected to each other. Very well said. And you put together a nice graphic for us to discuss this. So let's pull that up now. Um, this is a little hierarchy of of um, protective factors for suicide prevention. You modeled it after Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which is taught in most human development or a lot of different sociology, psychology, social work classes. Can you walk us through this a little bit, please? Sure. So um, on the left, 
you have kind of like a basic hierarchy of needs pyramid um, that I'm sure many of you have seen before. I just pulled this one off Wikipedia. <laughs> but um, basically, you start um, at the bottom with your basic needs. So first, it's like needs like food and water, then more like safety needs, then you get into the middle, which is like more social needs, um, relationships, and then you get higher up to, you know, your esteem, so like sense of self, sense of purpose. And then at the top is um, things that you do to, to um, feel fulfilled in your life, like creative pursuits and stuff like that. So really to get, you know, to that top, you have to um, also have the needs met from the bottom. So it would be really hard to say, feel like you um, can can explore your creative side when, you know, you don't have access to, like, basic, you know, food and water. So all of these needs need to be met um, in order to, you know, for anyone to have a fulfilling life, but also, you know, to prevent someone from um, feeling suicidal um, because these needs are being met. So on the right, you can kind of see how I've um, I took protective factors for suicide prevention and aligned them with the hierarchy of needs. Perfect. Hopefully you can see my little cursor. I'm trying to point to things that you're talking about. Um, I think this is great. And I think that like the, the common hierarchy of needs on the left can be used to guide our conversations about suicide prevention, but I really like what you did, putting it into kind of a little, a little stronger um, suicide prevention specific context. So it's not necessarily different than what's on the left, but it more closely aligns those things that are on the left with what we talk about when we talk about suicide prevention. And I just wanna reiterate one point you made that you can't take care of the stuff on top if you don't address the things on bottom first. I can't worry about falling in love if I'm currently being chased by a lion. Like I need to feel safe before I can think about friendships or being in a relationship or doing an art project. If I'm starving in the desert, I am not going to be worried about my AP exam next week, Thursday. The stuff on the bottom needs to happen first. Once that happens, um, we can go up the pyramid and pursue those things that keep us protected from declining mental health. So let's start at the bottom. The bottom on the right, we have food, water, and rest. And obviously those are helpful. No one thinks, oh yeah, I don't need food to live. I don't need water to live. I don't need rest to live. Um, but just to give you a little bit more of a mental health framework, there's a lot of research that study inconsistent sleep, um, consistent diets, can do as much to address the symptoms of certain mental illnesses as medication and as exercise and as a lot of other things and, and as uh, talk therapy also. Um, so if I'm, if I'm experiencing depression, let's say I've had depression for the last 10 years, um, maybe talk therapy was great at first or maybe um, just being prescribed antidepressants was great at first. And at some point I started having side effects or something else and I wanted to go from antidepressants to talk therapy um, then talk therapy was wonderful, but maybe I moved into like another therapist. And I started a regime of just eating healthy food, eating it consistently, going to bed at the same time every night, waking up at the same time every morning. There's research that shows that all three things, medication and talk therapy and um, the consistent schedule within good eating, all can positively affect depression about the same amount. You normally get a medically significant response in somewhere between a third to a half of all people who are experiencing depression if you have one of those interventions, either medication, therapy, or the lifestyle stuff, sleep, healthy diet. Um, exercise is another component. So yeah, of course it's important to eat and to drink water and to sleep to live, but there's a very specific mental health tie-in as well. And most of the research that I've looked at is around depression specifically, but I know there are relationships between diet, exercise, sleep, 
and anxiety as well. And I'm sure other um, psychiatric illnesses in general. Um, our body can adjust to changes in sleep cycles of about 15 to 20 minutes a day. So let's say I normally go to bed at 10 and wake up at six. If I wanted to, to start going to bed later, waking up later, I could do that like pretty safely in about 15 minute increments. I could start going to sleep at 10.15, waking up at 6.15, then maybe a couple days later, 10.30, 6.30. You can move it in small increments, but there are deleterious, I think I'm saying that word correctly, effects if you change your sleep cycle more than 15 minutes between days. Um, again, this isn't just like, these are nice thoughts, like there's research about it, and your sleep affects your mental well-being. So having consistent sleep, Having a good diet is a piece of good mental health promotion. Mel, what else do we need to say here? What about I, would, I would just add that typically these basic needs, because they are, you know, basic, are sometimes the first thing to go when someone is trying to, you know, get a project done or get an assignment in on time. And I, I see, I mean, having, be, being a, somewhat recent college graduate, like I saw so many times people, you know, not taking care of their basic needs. And I did myself, you know, like not getting enough sleep, um, not eat, like not eating because you just don't have time. And that can contribute so much to your stress and so much to your mental distress. Um, a lot of times people are just like, oh, like I'm so stressed. I'm, I'm just, it's all of this stuff that's going on. But really like it's that and it's also the fact that you might not be meeting your basic needs. You might not be getting that um, full amount of sleep as Aaron said, you know, can have a really significant impact on your mental health. So um, keeping that in mind as well, that, that basic needs are sometimes the things that we um, don't, take into account the most. Um, yeah, well said. And the other piece that I want to mention before we move up to the pyramid here is that when you do have, if you are unsettled in those basic needs, if you are hungry, if you are tired, it's going to affect all the other stuff in this pyramid, even if it's short term, like I'm crabby before I go to bed. If I'm crabby to somebody else because I'm not aware of the fact that I'm tired and therefore crabby, it's going to affect my social connections, which is just going to have this compounding negative effect on my mental well-being. So even on normal days like today, like I got a good night's sleep last night. I ate breakfast this morning. At some point today, I'm going to be tired. So just having that self-awareness of like, all right, when I'm tired, I am at risk of worsening one of the other components of this pyramid. So I need to be aware of that and have a plan in place. Maybe that means not talking to anyone the hour before I go to sleep. Because I might be crabby and say something that I don't want to say. Or, like, you, know, you just have to be aware of this stuff. And it's not hard. Most of us know it already. I think that your thinking probably evolves a, a little bit over time. But just that awareness and the day-to-day -day effect that these things have on you as well as the long term. So like eating pizza for two weeks is going to have a different effect than if you're hungry right now. Um, both are relevant to this conversation. So let's go up one level now and talk about this second step here. Safe and hygienic living con conditions and physical self-care. And I think that is another one that like really shows when people are stressed or busy. Um, you know, maybe your house gets dirty. Maybe you haven't taken a shower for a few days. Maybe you cancel some appointments that you're going to. Like you, you put off going to the dentist. You put off going to the doctor. That basic, like, taking care of your body stuff that you want to do. And again, like it's not just nice to present yourself as a, with washed hair, um, but it also does have a real effect on your mental health. And that feeling of being disheveled, particularly somebody um, who might be experiencing some type of anxiety disorder, feeling disheveled and scattered themselves about their appearance or their living environment, is going to have a real effect on their um, mental state. So this stuff ties into mental health. It's not just that a clean living room is a nice living room. It's that the feeling of scattered, when you are prone to feeling scattered and having that heighten your anxiety, um, can have a real effect on your mental health. 
um, physical injury, having mental illness that is debilitating to the point where you lose your housing or you can't keep safe water. I think for this middle one, um, it's it can be those things that get in the way of accessing this, but I think it's broader and more nuanced to think about the things that get in the way of a sense of community and social connections. Like obviously a pandemic does. We're trying to stay away from folks physically and that's going to affect the social distance also, the phrase we've been using. Um, things like discrimination are going to get in the way of this. If I feel discriminated again, just in my community, I'm not going to feel comfortable connecting with everyone. I might not feel comfortable meeting with other people who are like me if I feel like that's not okay where I am. And that could work where I am could be a town, it could be in a school, it could be in a you know, like little subcategory of the larger community. If it's not okay to be connect with other people that I want to connect with because of my identity, that is going to inhibit this layer of protective factors. Um, bullying is another piece of it. So a little bit different than discrimination, but ultimately has the same effect where I'm not going to feel comfortable connecting with others if I feel like I'm physically at risk. Um, and so it's just these different cultural and social ills that inhibit this category. And that's why things like um, pursuing social justice are absolutely a part of suicide prevention because we want to increase all these protective factors. And I think that the pursuit of social justice and allowing people to express themselves and connect with others over their identity is a key piece of this and the next level of the pyramid of protective factors. And so thinking about all the different ways that we can promote community and social connections and all the different things that get in the way of it and inhibit those connections is a key part of, of, um, of the protective factors for suicide prevention. There's a specific question on the youth risk behavior survey that's given to the students in um, high school all across the country in Juno as well. And that is around having trusted adults in their lives. And I think that's a big part of the strong support system that's listed here. So for young people, if they do have trusted adults in their lives, that's great. That's gonna help them so much in this particular category. And if they don't, then they are missing out on a key protective factor. Um, so programming where, where young people get trusted adults in their lives is integral to promoting these protective factors. And that's another reason why we've had so many different community partners on this month and why we'll continue to do so. And why we have the programming that we have. Um, we want to foster those strong support systems so that young people can increase their social connections their sense of community and give them a strong support system so that they have healthy, robust, protective factors as they go through life. Now, what else do we have? Um, so the next tier is purpose and sense of self, which you were kind of going into. Um, but just to remind everyone um, who's attending, you can ask us questions if you'd like. Uh, um, additional comments you want to make. Um, but yeah, like purpose and sense of self absolutely connect with community. Um, and then, you know, developing a sense of, of identity, a sense of purpose, you know, kind of figuring out what you want to do and um, how you want to uh, pursue, you know, uh, your interests. And that also leads up to the final tier, which is, you know, the things that you can, you are able to do once all of, you know, the previous needs have been met. And that's, you know, that's really good to be able to, like, pursue things for fun and fulfillment. Um, but I also think that it's important to keep in mind with suicide prevention that a lot of people are not at that top tier. I'm not at that top tier right now. <laughs> um, I'm trying to like figure a lot of other basic needs out first. Um, so I think that's also important to keep in mind that, you know, not, you can't expect 
someone to, you know, be like, it, it's not as linear as we're making it. You know, sometimes it goes up and down. Sometimes, you know, you're able to have a really strong sense of community, but like you don't, you know, you can't, you don't have a good living condition or, you know, something else. And, and it can, you know, you can kind of like go up and down on this list have some things that feel fulfilled and some things that don't. Um, but generally speaking, um, to try to have some kind of um, engagement with every level um, is a way to, you know, protect your mental well-being. And um, it's not always easy and not everybody is always going to be, you know, fulfilling every single one of these needs, but, but all of them together can work to um, be protective factors. Do you like to add to that? No, I think you said it very well. Like it, it all works together and you can't address the top without having something at the bottom, but there is always work to do in every category. Um, and you can, like you said, move up and down and address things in multiple places at once. Um, for sense of self, purpose of sense of self, I that gets into your self-expression, identity, where you get that like just good feeling in your gut about things you do. And that can be creative pursuits, which you see in the top. It can be your identity uh, based on religion, based on race or ethnicity, um, based on what you do professionally or as a hobby. There's, like, there's just so many things up there and um, I think working through that is really relevant and really hard to do and really zeroing in on like what is the satisfying thing or things that you do um, to give you that sense of self and that fun and fulfillment. Um, for me, I've at various times in my life thought that like, oh, music is a thing. But really, it was being around other people. And so it was really just social connection that I was getting out of playing music. And so it's hard to like, it's just, it's hard to know. It's helpful to think it through. There's of a pretty common phrase in the mental health world about values and you can find a lot of resources online values worksheets to really help you kind of think that through and narrow in on just what are those core needs that you are meeting when you hang out with your family or hang out with your friends or go to that group you go to on thursday evenings or volunteer at that place you volunteer at try to zero in on like what needs you're filling because you are filling a need with every way that you choose to spend your working and free time. Um, so it's just helpful to have that self-awareness. And then also when you're engaging with other people, to just be aware of where they're at and to meet them where they're at, rather than, you know, say, oh, like, well, this, this is where I'm at, so this is what I think would be helpful for you. If someone is struggling with, like, a basic safety need, um, that might be the thing to address rather than, you know, fun and fulfillment or something like that. So keeping this in mind, you know, as just like a general guide for yourself can be helpful or for when you're engaging with others. But, you know, again, it's not like a strict linear thing. It's just, you know, some thoughts we put together. So. Yeah. And I think that there's like a common, I think like, common phrase that misses the point around suicide, like, oh, that person had everything going for them. What happened? And like, maybe they did have fun and fulfillment, but they were missing out on something much more basic. Maybe they didn't feel like they had a sense of self or they didn't have a strong support system in their lives. And that was the piece that was missing. Um, and so I, just like you said, like, there's a lot of ways to put the complexity of suicide into context. This is one, and I think this is one way to help think it through. Um, in a public situation and in your own life, uh, with the different pieces that are involved in keeping people healthy and safe. So we, we have a couple questions. Tina, thank you for sending them in. And Tina, I also can't go to Facebook since I have this up. So if you can check and see if we have any questions on our Facebook page, that would be awesome. Um, we got a couple questions in our Zoom chat box about this video being shared with other groups. And so let me tell you again that this video will be saved on our Facebook page and can be viewed whenever. And at the end of the month, 
Mel is compiling all of our videos and we'll make them available on YouTube as well. So this can live on, not just in our hearts and minds, but also on the internet where everything lives on forever. Um, so this video can be shared with other groups and we're also available to do this type of presentation or anything that you hear us talking about this month. So this can live on in a brand new way as a future presentation to other groups. We have a, another question about support groups that understand all of this. Um, Nami Juno has a couple of online support groups that are currently meeting. Um, there's a connection support group for people with mental illness who are in recovery from mental illness who share information with one another and talk about these topics as it relates to mental illness. Um, you can find our schedule for that meeting on namijuno.org. And there's also a family support group for family members of people that again, they, they, it's not put in this context, but essentially what you're talking about is how to meet these needs when you have a family member in recovery from mental illness. So two support groups, one for family members, one for people with mental illness um, that are listed on the namijuno.org website and that we promote on our Nami Juno social media accounts. Mel, do you have any last words of wisdom for us? Um, no, I think um, about some Zidafa. And um, yeah, that it was a uh, helpful, you know, kind of visual for people. Um, but again, you know, it's not set in stone or anything. And um, I'm glad that uh, we got to talk about this. And I'm looking forward to our. Um, following events for the week where we'll be diving more into this prevention system. Thank you so much. I appreciate you putting this together. Appreciate your expertise for, you know, that you shared with us for the last 30 minutes. Um, for those of you who are viewing, appreciate your time and attention. And yeah, tune in tomorrow and the rest of the week and the rest of the month at noon on Zoom or Facebook Live. Thank you, everybody.